so now we're joined by Sandy Brown, who's running for City Council District 5. So go ahead with a two-minute introduction. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you here this evening. And uh, congratulations on a great process here in the 36th Legislative District. I'm Sandy Brown, and I'm running for City Council because I believe in Seattle, and I believe that we can be a truly great city, and not only a great city, but that we can lead the way for cities across the country. I grew up in Seattle, actually in the white center part, just south of Seattle. My mom is Mexican-American, my father uh, was from North Carolina, and we moved to Seattle when I was seven years old. And uh, then began the process of going through public schools, I graduated from Evergreen High School, and then along with my parents, who graduated one year earlier than me, I graduated from the University of Washington in 1978. And I did have some classes with my mom and dad. I went on to become a United Methodist pastor, a very liberal, progressive pastor, and included in that at this time as the executive director of the Church Council of Greater Seattle, one of our most progressive social justice organizations in the city. I've worked in the areas of homelessness and marriage equality and also gun responsibility. In the area of homelessness, I helped to found the Committee to End Homelessness in King County. I fought suburban city, tent city restrictions. I created one of the top homeless shelters in the city of Seattle. I was one of the key spokespeople for marriage equality and the successful R74 campaign. And then after the Sandy Hook shootings, I gathered people together and helped to create the Washington Alliance for Gun Responsibility, which just put Initiative 594 on the ballot. And we succeeded in November with 59% of the votes statewide. So I have a long resume of helping move us forward in important issues in the city and in the state, and I'd like to bring that experience to the city of Seattle as council member for District 5. Great, thank you. So now we'll move to the follow-up questions. You can turn over the sheet in front of you if you want to follow along, although we will read them aloud. Um, these are two-minute answers. And David, will you start with number one? <clears throat> Good question. Uh, Sandy, Seattle is experiencing a housing affordability crisis. Several policy responses have been suggested, including linkage fees, incentive zoning, subsidized housing and rent control, and others. What is your approach to keeping Seattle affordable? This is a very important issue because Seattle is increasingly becoming unaffordable for people either on fixed income or people who are just entering into the housing market. And I believe it's going to take a combination of public and private work in order to accomplish this, in order to increase the supply of housing. The public work that we need to do is we we'll need to generate more subsidized housing in Seattle, especially for the areas in the population that are 0 to 30 percent and probably 30 to 60 percent of the median wage. We also need to find more workforce housing that likely should be provided through the private market. And so, as well in the subsidized housing area as initiating programs such as the use of city and county surplus property and creating a bridge loan system for housing builders and the nonprofit world to be able to purchase properties as they become available. In the private market, we're also going to have to find ways in order to incentivize developers <coughs> to build workforce housing. An example of that is the multifamily tax exemption which we, can, uh, which we can tailor now, since it's up for renewal, to include a mandate for families and individuals who are at lower economic income strata than what that program currently includes. We should also be doing incentive zoning. We should also be tacking on the development impact fees, because Seattle is one of the very few cities in the state of Washington that doesn't have development impact fees, and we can use those funds to help with our streets and our schools and our public safety infrastructure. So we can do this. I support the mayor's work and the HALA task force, but I think it's going to give us a good step ahead. And when that comes before the city council, it should be carefully reviewed, but hopefully it will be the dramatic kind of change that we need in affordable housing. Thank you. John, number two. <clears throat> sure. Uh, last year, voters approved a levy to fund the Universal Preschool Pilot Program. After the pilot concludes, how would you fund the full implementation of the program, and what policy changes would you make to assure this plan addresses educational disparities in our city? 
I think that the civic leaders that took on the task of putting together the pre-K program did an excellent job. And I'm proud that we in the city of Seattle <coughs> that. The challenge is, what do we do after the funding runs out, and then what do we do in order to make certain that that goes not just to the kids that are identified in the program, but to all kids in Seattle. We have a major problem in Washington State with our tax structure. And even as we think about how we're doing local funding for preschool, we should be thinking about how we are doing funding for K-12 education, which we have not settled on in the legislative session. It all boils down to having a tax structure that is workable so that we don't have people who are in the lower economic strata paying a high percentage of their taxes, but instead we have people that can most afford it be able to pay their taxes or be able to support these important programs. So I support things like the, uh, like the capital gains tax on the state level and other things that target people of high incomes. And we should be able to have state funding for innovative programs such as this. I'm glad that King County is pursuing the same kind of program and, and on a county level, and we need to be able to offer this in the city as well, as long as we're able to put the tax system Call you number three. <clears throat> Bertha is still stuck. What options does the city of Seattle have with respect to potential cost overruns, the waterfront transit, and an unsafe fire? Bertha is still stuck. I was driving down the viaduct today and I looked out and I saw the huge amount of paraphernalia that are there by the viaduct in order to rescue the drilling in. And it's amazing. I was thinking about how good we are at mega projects like that in terms of finding funding for them. But at the same time, we can't find funding to keep people off the streets or to fund our schools. And that's a little bit of a problem that we can do one of those and not the other. The problem that the city of Seattle needs to avoid is under any circumstances to be on the hook for cost overruns for Berkeley. So even though that was written into the legislation that the city of Seattle would have to do that, we should take it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court if we have to in order not to be responsible for those cost problems. And what we are going to need to do in terms of um, the waterfront, if Bertha <coughs> stays stuck and somehow they put the drill head back on, they burrow through the city and get stuck under the Rainier Tower or something like that and they can't dig it out, then we're going to have to come up with Plan B. And we sure hope that we don't have to get there. But what it's probably going to require is that we have some sort of alternate plan in place that allows us to take down the viaduct, which we know is unsafe, and reroute traffic through the neighborhood or through the downtown area. The SR-99 corridor right now is important to us in West Seattle. We rely on that to get back and forth. It'd be so much better if we would have, in my opinion, if we had put that money into a rapid transit or a mass transit system. Um, that, for instance, might have planted in Ballard and West Seattle and then put freight on the streets instead. Right. Mary, number four. Okay. Uh, Seattle is the fastest growing city in the country. Should we encourage or discourage this growth? And what policy changes are necessary to accommodate the growth? Well, I think the growth is going to happen regardless. And so it's, uh, it's a great place to be in, when you're in a city that people want to come and live there. And so it just turns out, and it's a little bit surprising, that even people that work in Bellevue and Redmond and Kirkland want to live in Seattle. <laughs> and so we've learned that the numbers are pretty surprising to the people that live here but work across the way because they like the quality of life. So what we have to do as we grow is that we have to make sure certain that we're growing in a smart and green way. And by smart, I mean that there is the opportunity for us to add density in places where it will actually improve the quality of our communities. The example is at Lake City and Lake City Way and Northeast Corner. Our leaders in that area want to have increased density because they know that with density from multiple different economic groups, they can create a vibrant retail core along Lake City Way at 125th. So they're anxious to not have to drive to Ballard or to Capitol Hill or to Fremont to have a great restaurant or a nice shopping experience. They want to be able to do that in Lake City or Lake City Way. And we can do that with increased density there. 
It should be green as well because whatever additional density that we have should be around transport workers. It should always be transit oriented in development so that we're not increasing the number of cars on our streets. We can't really build any more streets. We're all built out that way. But we can be certain that we improve our transit so that when new residents come in, they've got the bus routes to take them to work and they have a way to uh, be able to fulfill their economic needs at the same time as not having to have, uh, to have cars as we have in the past. All right, so now we have time for follow-up questions. These are one-minute answers. I know you're very concerned about homes. Um, I know somebody who became homeless uh, last year, about a year ago, and he went to the Seattle Housing Association and to apply for a place and was told that the waiting list is 27,000 people. Um, what <coughs> thoughts do you have about the Seattle Housing Association uh, in terms of City Council races allows us to be very neighborhood focused and local in our efforts, and yet it absolutely has to play into the greater Seattle um, efforts to create good public policy. How will you balance the public policy needs of the city of Seattle, consistency, quality initiatives, etc., with the local neighborhood needs that you've talked about in certain ways? That's a really good question. The, uh, there are two examples of how I would be balancing that. One I've talked about when I have it. The first is the issue of homelessness. And homelessness is an issue in North Seattle, though we tend to think of it as a downtown issue. It's completely wrong to think of homelessness as a District 7 issue. It's a district everything issue, including King County and all over the US. And so in order to solve it for District 5, we're going to have to solve it for the other districts in the city at large and for the region. So that means having one foot in District 5's issue and one foot in the 
condition at large. I'm very comfortable with that. That's the work I've done in homelessness. The other question is, or the other example is an interesting one, because when I knock on doors, and I've knocked on over 5,000 doors now uh, in District 5, when I knock on doors, the thing that I hear is we need to have more police protection. Interestingly, people do not say we need to have police who are more responsive to uh, the differences of Seattleites or that are following the consent decree and the federal monitor. People in North Seattle aren't saying that. And so as we increase police protection, we also need to be make, making certain that we are doing it in such a way that we're responsive to the needs of the diversity of Seattle. So those two things have to go hand in hand. So that one, then Joseph? Timing and asking. You're really great at the timing. Right? Yeah, no, I, I improved. Last time I was terrible. Uh, my question is a two-parter. I apologize. Uh, I'm going to pose a short hypothetical. Let's say you are elected, you're an incumbent council member. Would you ever, even if it were entirely legal, host a campaign event at City Hall at the same time that you are uh, simultaneously hosting a city-funded event in council chambers? And either way, the following week, would you or would you not uh, call for uh, or sponsor a resolution that either censured or somehow reprimanded a council member that held such a campaign. Event. Thank you. <laughs> I actually looked at the ethics rules today. It's illegal for a city employee to have a political event in City Hall or in any city hall. <laughs> so it's interesting that I currently could have a political event at City Hall. But if I were elected, and that was included in your uh, question, if I were elected, I would be a city employee and I would not be able to have a political event at City Hall. So the answer is no, I would not hold an event if I were a city, city council member uh, in City Hall. It would be illegal for you to do that. And uh, I forget the other part now. Would you call for a resolution of censoring someone that did? I don't think that's necessary. There are rules, and, um, and there's a whole enforcement mechanism in the Seattle City Ethics and Elections uh, Commission. So I don't think it needs to be done on a council basis. Thank you. Joseph? So you've talked a lot about addressing the housing affordability crisis by partnering with private entities. What do you think about the proposal to levy public bonds and build public housing on public lands? I, am in, I would be in favor of that. The biggest question is actually a feasibility question. And the feasibility question is how much do we have left between what we have borrowed and what the borrowing is in our bonding authority. Mm -hmm. And I understand it's not quite as much as some people think it is. On the other hand, we know that King County has a lot of um, a lot of room left before it reaches its bonding, the full extent of its bonding capacity. So it may be something that we need to do, but we in the city of Seattle aren't able to do it. We'll have to find a partner because I think the county can already do it for us. I have nothing against that. King County Housing Authority, Seattle Housing Authority, many housing authorities do that. Those are public funds as well. And it's certainly a useful um, way to, to spend, an important way to spend public funds in order to provide more public housing and subsidize housing for people that are uh, earning less than the most wages. Uh, so I've got a quick question. So initiative 122 has been filed. If, if passed, would uh, establish a small levy that would fund a public financing program with uh, vouchers. Um, have you signed that petition? Do you support it? And how do you think it would affect city council elections going forward? I signed the petition. I'm not sure that it's the fix that we're looking for. And um, what's interesting to me since running for office is that a big aspect of what people can and can't do is use of their own resources. So for instance, in our district, we have a candidate that is almost exclusively funding her campaign through her personal contributions. And if she opts out of that system, I understand that would still be possible. And I think that's not a, a wise or legitimate thing. I think it's better for us to have a wide amount of support uh, when we run for office. The city of Seattle already has a 700 per person per cycle uh, maximum, and that's pretty good. Uh, that's much better than the state maximum and far better than the federal maximum as well. And so I think it's probably okay, but what we have to work out in any system that we do is actually, what is the candidate's personal contribution, and is it fair for them to be financing their own election? Because that does make it money. Great. So
about out of time if you want to take no more than 30 seconds for a closing statement. I'm sorry that we're out of time. This has been a stimulating conversation. Thank you very much. I am a Democrat and have been a Democrat all of my life because of my belief in the importance of our responsibility for each other. That's what the Democratic Party is about. We believe that we want to create a community based on compassion where everybody, regardless of their race, regardless of their sexual orientation, regardless of their income, has a place in our community. And we know that for equity's sake, sometimes that means we have to give people a hand up in order to make it. And that's the kind of thing that I would like to do as a Seattle City Council member. I'd like to bring that idea of compassion and responsibility to City Hall and make city, the city of Seattle a great place for all of its residents. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.